This is the NBC University Theater, bringing you a full hour dramatization of Edith Wharton's classic novel, The Age of Innocence, starring John Sutton. Today, a story by the great lady of American letters, Edith Wharton, formerly Miss Edith Jones of New York, Newport, and the principal cities of Europe. This is a story of New York in the 70s, the age of innocence, a story of drawing rooms and manners and social ostracism. For some of you, it may have nostalgic overtones, but for all of us, surely, it is a fine romance, the subtleties and passion of which have been well preserved in today's adaptation for radio by Clarice Ross. During the intermission, you will hear a recorded commentary on the works of Edith Wharton by Bennett Cerf. Here, then, The Age of Innocence, with stage and motion picture star John Sutton in the role of Newland Archer. It was too much. One wouldn't have thought that people would have dared such a thing. Of course, Cousin Van der Leiden must be told at once. He and Cousin Louisa would know how to deal with the situation. After all, the Van der Leidens, together with the Lannings and Dagonets of Washington Square, were the real aristocracy of New York. Everyone knew that. Mother and I called on them as soon as we heard the news. Henry Van der Leiden listened to what I had to say very carefully. Now, let me understand you, Newland. You say every one of the dinner invitations was declined? Every one, sir. Oh, this is shocking, no one's shocking. They simply refused to meet the Count Zelenska. And after all, she was a Mingert. We knew that since Newland's marrying into the family so soon, you'd want to know, Henry. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, no one in New York has a right to pronounce on the Mingert social position. And since they've taken the Countess back into the family, that is final. We hoped you'd see it this way, Cousin Henry, for May's sake. Mm -hmm. Miss Welland's a fine girl, Newland. I approve heartily of your choice. Then all the Mingotts are fine people. But now about this, um, Miss Ellen Olenska. There are rumors. Oh, well, she left her husband. No one denies that. Mm, some Polish nobleman or other, wasn't it? Uh, she might have married a man one knew to begin with. <laughs> you forget, sir. She's lived in Europe most of her life. Yes, that would excuse it. But isn't there something about a man, the Count's secretary? Uh, lady helped the Countess to get away from her husband. Uh, for a reward, perhaps? <gasps> Cousin Henry. Oh, excuse me, my dear Adeline. I only like to have the details. They do not alter the fact that Ellen Olenska has now come home to her family and must be accepted as a member of it. The Mingotts are quite daring, really. Imagine living in that wilderness near the Central Park where no one has ever lived above 34th Street. Well, yeah, just so, Adeline. Mrs. Mingott can scarcely be troubled if her granddaughter is a little uh, conspicuous. <clears throat> But now, um, about this dinner of Miss, Mrs. Wellens, is too late to save that. I'm afraid so, sir. Still, no one in New York shall refuse to meet a Mingott. Now, it so happens that my dear Louisa's English relative arrives for a visit next week. <gasps> the Duke of St. Austria? Yes. Oh. Louisa and I were planning a dinner for him. Oh, just a small affair. But there will be um, quite a large reception afterwards. It may be that the Countess Olenska will let us number her among our guests. I knew he could rely on you, sir. Cousin Henry, you are too kind. Everyone knows what you and Cousin Louisa represent. Oh, well, there's nothing to thank me for, my dear Adeline, but um, I believe that perhaps Louisa and I do represent something in New York. <laughs> and this kind of thing shall not happen as long as I can prevent it. Ancestress of all the vast Mingott clan, reigned supreme in her huge outlandish house, and from it dictated her descendants, with a vigor not diminished by the weight of the mountains of fat which had long since settled upon her. A 
visit to her could be an awful thing. On the other hand, it could also be pleasant. So you put a word in Henry van der Leiden's ear, did you, Newland? I thought you might suspect it, Mrs. Mingott. Ah, if I could get up out of my chair and move, I'd go to that dinner myself. We'll show those upstarts how to send their regrets to our Mingott. I must thank you, Newland. You've shown admirable loyalty to our family. Well, it'll be my family soon, Mrs. Welland. Well, not too soon, Newland. I shouldn't think my May is in such a hurry to leave me. Granny, Newland keeps pleading with Mama and me to let us get married right away. Isn't that sweet of him? Natural enough. He spent three times too much on that ring you're wearing. At least let him get his money's worth. Never. What does she mean, Mama? <laughs> Never mind, child. When's the wedding to be? Please back me up, Mrs. Mingott. May wants to wait a whole year. After all, Mother, we must give the children time to know each other a little better. And besides, Newland doesn't realize that there's 12 dozen of everything to be got ready, hand embroidered. My little May is going to have everything just right. <laughs> This is quite an occasion, Countess. Henry and Louisa van der Leiden seldom entertain. They've been wonderful, Newland. But why do you call me Countess? We used to play together when we were children. All right, then. Ellen. <laughs> Ellen, you happy to be home? Oh, I can hardly believe I've been away so many years. <laughs> I seem to see everybody still in knickerbockers and pantalettes. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be shocked to hear that. Oh, I suppose they're shocked anyway. What, what? Because you and I are talking. You should be talking to the Duke. <laughs> St. Austrey, but he's the dullest man I know. Oh, you, you've met him before? Well, yes. My husband and I used to see him every winter at Nice. Oh, yes, of course. Newland, Newland, tell me about May. I think she's a darling. Are you very much in love with her? As much as a man can be. Oh? Is there a limit to love, then? No, I haven't found it. <laughs> a real romance. And it was not arranged for you. Well, you forget... In our country, marriages are not arranged. Oh, yes, I had forgotten. Oh, you must forgive me if I make these mistakes. Well, and don't be unhappy. You're among friends here. I know. Oh, but look, May has arrived. You'll want to leave me. Oh, she's already surrounded. Now, there's the Duke being presented. Poor girl. Oh, but then, stay with me a little longer. I'd love to, Ellen. Well, Newland, are you monopolizing this charming lady? Oh, <laughs> not at all, Cousin Henry. I, I hadn't meant to. Will you excuse me, Countess? Oh, of course. But I shall expect you then after five tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, come, come, come away, come away, Newland. Others wish to converse with the Countess. I say, it was good of you to devote yourself so exclusively to Madame Olenska, Newland. My dear wife sent me to your rescue. You're so beautiful, May. Dear Newland, thank you. The worst of it is, I want to kiss you, and I can. What? In the middle of the Van der Leiden drawing room? May. May, why won't you marry me now? Why do we have to be engaged for so long? But Isabel Chivers and Reggie were engaged for two years. Aren't we very well off as we are? Why, we might be together all the time. We, we could travel. And... Oh, that would be lovely. But we'll have to wait, Newland. Mama wouldn't want us to do things so differently. And only because they're different. Oh, Newland, let's talk about something else. Newland, somebody has got to speak to Ellen. What about? She was seen walking down the street at noon today with Mr. Beaufort. Julius Beaufort? Well, he's a banker. That's respectable. Newland, you know perfectly well it isn't. He's a married man. Besides, no one really knows who he is. You mean he wasn't born in New York? Well, Ellen seems to like you, Newland. Would you please say something to her? Oh, frankly, I agree with you. Both it's none too savory a character. Perhaps I will say something to Madame Olenska, if uh, I have the opportunity. The next afternoon, after five, an Italian maid showed me into the parlor, the odd little house on West 23rd Street, where Ellen Olenska lived. 
was unlike any room a Mingott had ever lived in. There was no purple satin in it anywhere, and I had plenty of time to study it, for the Countess was away. And it was some time before I heard horses' hooves on the quiet little street and watched through the window as Ellen Olenska said goodbye to Julius Beaufort. Well, so you're here, Newland. How do you like my funny house? Uh, you've arranged it wonderfully. <laughs> yeah, let me help you with your coat. Oh, thank you. You know, the family hates it. But what I really like is that I'm alone in it. Are you so fond of being alone? Mm, as long as I don't feel lonely. <laughs> but after all, the family won't let me stay here. Isn't this street respectable? It's not fashionable. Oh, but why not make one's own fashions? Oh, no, but I don't want that. I want to be cared for and feel safe. Well, New York's a very safe place. I feel that. Do you? Mm, people like the Vandalines, they're so kind. Yes, they are, and they're also the most powerful influence in New York society. <laughs> well, you'll explain all these things to me. You'll tell me exactly what to do. Well, to begin with, stop being seen... What? Uh, nothing. Never mind. There are plenty of people to tell you what to do. <laughs> you mean all my aunts and my dear granny. <laughs> oh, no. No, there are only two people I trust here. You and Mr. Beaufort. I understand. But your grandmother Mingott and Mrs. Welland, they want to help you. Oh, Newland, they don't. Not really. What? Oh, well, they want to help me, but only on condition that they don't hear anything unpleasant. Real loneliness is living among all these kind people who only ask one to pretend. You sent for me, Mr. Letterblair? Yes, Archer. Uh, sit down. Sit down. There's a little matter I'd like to go into with you. Certainly, sir. Very interesting case, Archer. Divorce. Divorce? I don't ever remember Letter Blair, Lampson, and Lowe handling a divorce case. Not in my time, thank heaven. Uh, this will surprise you, Archer. I'm speaking to you at the direct request of Mrs. Manson Mingott. Her granddaughter, the Countess Olenska, wishes to sue for divorce. Pardon me, Mr. Letter Blair, but since I'm about to be a member of the family, I'd much uh, prefer the not... The family, Archer, expressly wishes your legal assistance. I see. Naturally, they are against the idea of divorce. But it seems that the Countess is firm. She must be persuaded out of it. The scandal would be fearful. Oh, but the Mingots are back, Madame Olenska. Uh, you will find among these papers, Archer, a letter from Count Olenska to his wife, declaring that if she attempts to get a divorce, he will defend the suit. And then? And then, Archer, he might, uh, I'm saying might, mind you, he might prove certain things which have thus far been only whispered. Do you understand? Well, do you think these vague threats of her husband's would carry any weight? Weight or not, if he defends the suit, it might be unpleasant. Unpleasant? What a word to use. Yes, unpleasant. I regard it as an excellent word. Divorce and scandal, Archer, are always unpleasant. Good evening, Signor. Uh, Mr. Archer calling. Is the Countess Olenska at home? Si, Signor. Someone is here. But you come in. Oh, in that case, perhaps I'd better... No, no, you come Who in. Who is it, Maria? Mr. Archer. Oh, ask him to come in. If I'm disturbing you, Countess, oh, no, I... No, no, my friend. Come in, sit down. You know Mr. Beaufort, I think? Yes, uh, certainly. How are you, Beaufort? Glad to see you, Archer. Perhaps you could make Madame Olenska change her mind. Change her mind? Imagine. She's going off to spend three whole days with the Vandalidens at that dreary country place of theirs at Skydercliff. Oh. <gasps> the Vandalidens are so kind, Mr. Beaufort. Granny says I must certainly go. Granny would, of course. And you'll find Granny, and you'll miss that jolly little oyster supper I've got planned for you on Sunday. <laughs> it does sound gay. I think I must really go to Skydercliff. But I'll think about it until tomorrow. Uh, why not think now? I cannot now. I have business to discuss with Mr. Archer. I see. Well, then, good night, dear Countess, Mr. Archer. Oh, uh, Archer, if you can get her to stop in town, uh, you can come along to supper, too. <laughs> good night. Ellen, go to Skydercliff. I shall. I want to get away. I want to get away from... Everything. I know. Mr. Letterblair has told me. Oh? Well, you know I'm in the firm. Why, I didn't know. Oh, how wonderful. 
You mean you can get me my divorce? Well, I'm here to talk about it. Oh, I want to be free. You will help me. Perhaps I... I should know a little more. What more? My life was unbearable with that man. Oh, I must be free of him. Yes, but if he fights the case as he threatens to... Then? Well, then he might say things that would be un... Uh, that might harm you, even if... If? Even if they're unfounded. What harm can such things do me? Think. What would you gain that would make up for all the beastly talk? My freedom. Is that nothing? You're free as the air. Who can touch you? No one. Well, then, after all, you can't make over society. No. I'm only trying to make you see how they feel. The family, everyone who's fond of you. I'm telling you how they judge things. It wouldn't be fair of me not to tell you, would no. it? No. No, 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 it wouldn't. I... I will do as you wish. You're very wise. I will give up my idea. And now... Good night. Ellie and I do so want to help you. You do help me. Good night, my cousin. I had the feeling that I had been plunged somehow into a world where the old familiar forms and ways of doing things were of no value. From that world, I looked back at the other and saw, as at the far end of a long telescope, my life my family, and May. But May was not with me, in obedience to the dictates of his position. Her father went to St. Augustine every winter, and there could be no question of his wife or daughter remaining at home. From St. Augustine, then, I received a letter in which my good, kind May begged me to watch out for her cousin, Ellen. Perhaps that letter was responsible for the fact that on Sunday I took a train and presently found myself trudging along a snowy footpath, a half mile from the Van der Leiden's house at Skytercliff. Newland, oh, Newland, you've come. Were you wanting me to? Oh, let's, let's walk on, shall we? It's cold. Ellen, you, you look troubled about something. Well, what does it matter? Now that you're here to protect me. From what? Oh, nothing. I, I didn't mean to say that. How did you happen to come? Well, I... Uh... Perhaps... Perhaps May ask you to look out for me? What a poor thing you must all think That's of. That's not true. Women here never seem to feel a need. Oh, I'd like to talk to you, but where, where? What's up this path here? I see smoke from a chimney. Well, is it still open? Oh, yes. come on, come on. What's still open? But well, don't you know it? Oh, it's the little house that used to belong to the old patroon who had this land. Why, yes, I've heard of it. Oh, look at it. So square and strong and solid. Mr. Van der Leiden had it open so that I could see it. Well, the door's unlocked. Oh, it's a doll's house. I feel as though I should be taking off wooden shoes. <laughs> Enter mine here. <laughs> Oh, isn't that a wonderful heart? Oh, it's so friendly. Oh, Ellen, you're laughing now. And a moment ago, you were unhappy. Yes. But I can't be unhappy when you're here. I shan't be here very long. I know. But I'm... I'm improvident. I live in the moment when I am happy. Ellen, you are glad I came here. Yes. Then tell me what made you unhappy before. Ellen... Ellen. Madame Olenska! Madame Olenska! Oh, no. Who is that? He's coming up the path. Oh, so that's it. Oh, I didn't know he was here. I didn't know he would come, Newland. Believe me. Mr. Beaufort? This way, Mr. Beaufort. I think Madame Olenska was expecting you. <laughs> Julius Beaufort, the man whom no one quite knew, had lived a life such as could remind Ellen Olenska of her past, the things she had hated in it, but also the things which had charm. This, then, was what had made her unhappy, that she despised the man, and yet was drawn to him. I believe that she had not expected him at Skytercliff. However, I had a sudden conviction that I wanted no more of either of them.
The immediate result of my visit to Spider Cliff was that I packed a portmanteau the next day and took the first boat for St. Augustine. But I could not sway the minds of either May or her mother. When I returned to New York, I tried a last resort. Where have you been, Newland? I took a winter holiday, Mrs. Mingott. I went down to St. Augustine. <laughs> Kicked over the traces, eh? I'll wager Augusta greeted you with a long face. No, oh, Mrs. Wellen was very kind, but May wouldn't agree to what I wanted. Wouldn't she, indeed? And what was that? I wanted her to promise to marry me in April. What's the good of waiting another year? And I know the answer. Ask Mama. <laughs> Mrs. Mingott, won't you use your influence with Mrs. Welland? I just don't like long engagements. No, I can see that. You've got a quick eye. <laughs> oh, but here's my Ellen. I see you have a visitor, Granny. <laughs> He's been down to Florida to see his sweetheart. May sends you her love, Ellen. Oh, that is kind of her. <laughs> Look at him. In such haste to get married, he runs down to implore her on his knees. <laughs> Granny, perhaps between us we can persuade the Wellens to do as Newland wishes. <gasps> well, it may be. It may be, and I want my nap now, boy. Show him out, will you, Ellen, like a dear? Certainly, Granny. Goodbye, Mrs. Mingott. Come again, Newland. Come soon. Ellen, when can I see you? Whenever you like. Tomorrow evening? Yes. But come early, I'm going out. With Beaufort? I'm going out, Newland. Come tomorrow evening. Early. Do you call this early, Newland? It's nearly half past nine. I'm sorry, I was detained. On purpose, I think. Is there something wrong? I don't know. Oh, Lenska is trying to get me to come back to him. No. He has sent a, a most magnanimous offer to me and to the family. I suppose they'll expect you to go. Many cruel things have been expected of me. Oh, Ellen, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Oh, it's all right. You have your own troubles. Why can't you get May to marry you? She thinks... She thinks I care for someone else. Then uh, all the more reason for her to hurry. Oh, she's not like that. She she wants to give me time. Time to give her up for the other woman? If I want to. That is noble. It's noble, but it's ridiculous. Because there is no other woman. Because I don't mean to marry anyone else. Oh. But May is right. There is someone else. Ellen, no. my dear... No, let go of my hand. Oh, don't make love to me, Newlyn. Too many people have done that. I never have. I never shall, but... If it had been possible for either of us, you are the woman I would have married. You can say that. You, when you made it impossible. I? You. You showed me that I had to give up getting a divorce to spare my family the scandal. I did it for you, for May's sake and for yours. I did it for you. And I thought You that... thought what? There were things in that letter of your husband's... I had that... nothing to fear from that. I only wanted to keep scandal away from you and May. Ellen and I loved you. Don't say that. Don't. Oh, Ellen, my darling. <laughs> oh, my poor Newland. This doesn't change anything. It changes my whole life. I'm married, and you're going to be. I'm still free, and you're going to be. Can you see me marrying May now? I don't see you putting that question to me. It's too late to do anything else. You say that because it's easiest, not because it's true. It is true. It can't be. You've shown me that, just as you've shown me everything. I? What have I done? You've showed me how to give up happiness that, that is bought by disloyalty and cruelty. I, I can't go back to any other way of thinking. Not anymore. Ellen, I can't understand you. Listen... May will give me up. Will she? Three days after you begged her on your knees to marry you at once. She has refused. Uh, Who's that? I, I don't know. I'm not expecting anyone. Perhaps it's both it after all. Telegram, Signora. Oh, thank you, Maria. <laughs> Ellen, what, what is it? Here. Read it. Dearest. Ellen, Granny's telegram successful. Papa and Mama agree marriage after Easter. 
am telegraphing Newland at once. Your grateful May. <laughs> We're almost there, May, darling. Don't leave anything behind. I shan't, Newland. Goodness, this traveling case looks so new, it fairly screams that I'm just married. Uh, there's nothing the matter with being just married. Oh, no, darling, of course not. Oh, it will be so good to have tea when we get there. I'm afraid you're tired. <laughs> no, I'm not. But it was good of Miss Dulac to lend us her house for these first few days. Oh, everything's perfect, Newland, isn't it? Everything, and you most of all. You're sweet. I do wish Ellen could have come to the wedding, don't you? It's too bad she was ill. Yes, it's too bad. She would have loved it. Come on, May, we're here. Uh, you got your cloak? Yes, yes, everything. I didn't think to ask who'd meet us at the station. I... Oh, I'm sure Miss Dulac will have sent someone. Well, of course. Hey, doesn't that fellow over there look familiar? Why, how very kind. It's the Van der Leiden's man. They've sent him over from Skytercliff. Oh, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Archer. Good evening. You're the driver, sir, of the Dulac place, aren't you? Well, no, sir. I'm extremely sorry, sir. There's been a little accident in Miss Dulac's. A small fire. Oh, nothing serious, but the house is quite upset. Oh, dear. What are we to do? It, it's all been arranged, Mrs. Archer. Mr. Van der Leiden heard of it this morning and sent a maid up to prepare things. You ought to stay at the old Patroon's house. No. Oh, Newland, think of it. The Patroon's house. Well, I've never even been inside it, have you? Why, no. No, I haven't. Well, uh, let's get started, shall we? Uh, this way, sir. Oh, Newland, this is exciting. Ellen told me it's the only house in America she could imagine being perfectly happy in. Well, well... That's what we're going to be, isn't it? Yes, dear. Of course. It's only the beginning of the wonderful luck we're always going to have together. Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you John Sutton in a radio version of Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence. And now, our intermission commentator, Mr. Bennett Cerf, distinguished publisher, author, and lecturer. Here now is Mr. Bennett Cerf. It was a pleasant surprise to reread The Age of Innocence and find it as fresh and alive as when I first read it 29 years ago. For it was way back in 1920 that this novel was published and received the Pulitzer Prize, surely one of the best awards that committee ever made. Part of my pleasure, I think, came from Mrs. Wharton's skill as a novelist, for her story is artfully composed and rich in memorable scenes and incidents. But most of it came from her even greater skill as a social historian, for in this novel she returned to the period and scenes of her youth and immortalized high society in New York at its most elegant its most conventional and its stuffiest decade, the 1870s. The plot of The Age of Innocence is simple. Newland Archer, decorously engaged to be married to May Welland, conceives a headlong passion for his fiancée's cousin, the Countess Olenska. The Countess has recently returned from Europe under the shadow of a cloud. She had run away from the wicked nobleman who had married her for her money and had brought back to America the free and easy manners of the old world. It was said that she indulged in cigarettes, and even that she contemplated a divorce. To the ultra-conservative circle of that period, such goings-on threatened her entire position in society. For a lady of the 70s was a lady only so long as her conduct was drearily irreproachable. Under the circumstances, it was natural for the chivalrous Mr. Archer to become first her defender and then her admirer and equally natural for May M. Ellen to fight with every weapon at hand to rescue him from the Countess. It's hard to believe that New York society was once so conventional that a charming woman might be ruined by the rumor of a single false step. 
And it's an immense tribute to Mrs. Wharton's talent as a storyteller that a picture of that society should be so real and convincing as to challenge comparison even with that of her friend and master, Henry James. Speaking of the slipshod and casually constructed autobiographical novels that were even then beginning to come into vogue, Mrs. Wharton once said, The whole immense machinery of the passions is put in motion for causes that a modern schoolgirl would laugh at. It's as if grown people with faces worn by passions and experience were acting a play that was written in the nursery. Well, as a publisher, I say to that, Amen. It's my duty, and occasionally my pleasure, to read many, many manuscripts. I only wish that more of them were written with a serious craftsmanship and mastery of form and material that Edith Wharton displays in the Age of Innocence. Thank you, Mr. Bennett, sir. Our radio version of The Age of Innocence, starring John Sutton, will continue after a brief pause for station identification. had a wedding trip to Europe. And when we came home to the little yellow stone house her father had bought for us and took up our lives together, the momentary madness of the eve of my marriage began to seem like no more than the last of a series of old discarded experiences. Certainly, I had the handsomest and sweetest of wives, one of the most popular young married women in New York, Anna Berlin. I heard vaguely that she was living in Washington, but that was all. She was a ghost, and May was my wife. We spent the winter in town, and in the summer we went with the Wellens and the Mingotts and everyone else to Newport. Granny! Granny! Oh, there she is, through the gate in the side garden. Who is it? Oh, I knew little my boy, and me, dear. How are you, Granny? Oh, I'm well enough. Though I'm sure if I weren't, there'd be no one here to know it. <laughs> we came with good news, Granny. May won the archery contest. Has she indeed? Well, good enough. See the lovely diamond tipped arrow? This was the prize. Ah, very liberal. Very handsome. Quite an heirloom, in fact. Hurry up and have a girl so you can leave it to her. Oh, Granny. Uh, now what have I said to make you blush? Ah, uh, what a girl. Well, well, did you see Ellen? Ellen? Certainly, she's just left. You might have passed her in the street. Ellen was here? Been with me for two days. If you'd come oftener, you'd know. Is she... is she coming back? No. More's the pity. I wanted her to stay. Well, then why has she gone? Oh, heaven knows. Said she had business in Boston. Sent my man to telegraph the Parker house for a room, and off she went. I beg pardon, sir. What? Where have you been, man? You took long enough. I'm very sorry, sir, but I brought your note back. You brought it back? Why? The people in the Parker house say the lady has gone out, sir. Oh, I see. All right, thank you. Here you are. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, the man added, sir, that he believed it was possible the lady had gone for a walk across the common. <laughs> Ellen. Oh. May I share the bench with you? Oh, yes. Yes, certainly. Sit down, Ellen. I'm uh, in Boston on business. I just got here. Strange. I'm here on business, too. Successfully, I trust? Well, I don't know. I've just refused to take back a sum of money that belonged to me. What? You mean the Lenska? Yes. Someone has come here to meet you? Yes. And you refuse the offer? I, I didn't care for the conditions. That swine. What were his conditions? Oh. They're not that bad. Just to sit at the head of his table now and then. He wants you back at any price. Well, a, a considerable price. At least it seems considerable to me. And you came here to meet him? Meet him? You mean my husband? 
<laughs> He's always in Baden at this time of the year. Well, he sent someone with a letter then. <laughs> oh, no. No, just a message. He never writes. Why? Why should he? What does one have secretaries for? Oh, yes. Secretaries. And you came out here to think it over? Huh? I came out here for a breath of air. The hotel is stifling. Ellen, I want to get you away from, from that man, from all thoughts of him. Let's take the steamer down to Point Arley. Your business in Boston? Oh, I haven't any. I invented it. Come on. Oh, Newland, I... Don't I... be afraid. Come with me. Ellen, why shouldn't we have this little time? In heaven's name, darling, we've done all we could. sit in the shade under this tree. Oh, yes. This is wonderful, isn't it? Are you glad you came along? <laughs> it seems as though this is the first chance I've had to draw a breath of real air in ever so long. <laughs> you must be choking on our dullness, all of us. Ellen, sometimes I wonder why you don't go back. Sometimes I... I think it's because of you. At least you've made me understand all the good things about the life here. I'm really what you've made of me, Newland. And I? I'm the man who married one woman because another told him to. You aren't to say such things today. No bad things, eh? Nothing unpleasant. Is it bad? Is it bad for me? Oh, that's what we've got to think of, isn't it? Why? Well, because if it is bad, if it's not worth our having given up everything, then the things I think that are good here are nothing but a dream. And then? And then then I have no reason for not going back. You will stay while my marriage lasts. Is that what you're trying to say? Ellen, this is beyond human endurance. Don't say that. I'm enduring it. You? Ellen, all this time, Don't you touch too? Me. Don't touch me, please. Are you going? No. No, not yet. Sometime? Not... Not as long as you hold out. Not as long as we can look straight at each other like this. Oh, my dearest, what a life for you. But it's part of yours. That, that's to be all, either of us. Oh, please, please don't be unhappy. Ellen, promise me, promise me you won't go back. I promise, Newland, I won't go back. Months passed, and I did not see Ellen again. She returned to Washington, I to New York. For I tried not to notice that her name was no longer mentioned in the family. But in the fall, something happened which shook all of society to its foundations. Cousin Henry Vandeleiden was full of it as we sat over our cigars after Thanksgiving dinner. Well, if it comes, Nolan, it's going to be terrible. Terrible for all of us. After all, we've had this man in our homes. Well, do you think it will come? I'm afraid there's no doubt of it. Beaufort's been speculating, and he's going to go bankrupt. It's a shocking thing, Cousin Henry. Yes, it is, my boy. Things like this simply do not happen in New York. The worst of it is, I'm afraid there will be, um, disclosures. Mr. Beaufort's private life. Perhaps he'll pull out of the smash yet. Uh, perhaps. They're trying to tide him over, of course, for his wife's sake. After all, she's part of the family. She's a Dallas of South Carolina. Poor woman. A poor woman, yes. I only hope, Nolan, that Beaufort's bankruptcy won't touch the family still closer. What do you mean, sir? Well, my boy, I've heard most disturbing rumors. People are saying that Ellen Olenska should have gone back to her husband. Ellen? What's this got to do with her? Well, nothing, I hope, Nolan. But there's been talk. Madame Olenska forfeited all her money by not returning to the Count. Yes, of course, but Granny's been taking care of her, and it's... Oh, I see you haven't been told. Well, <laughs> Catherine Ming had cut the allowance in half when Olenska's last offer was refused. No, no, I, I hadn't been told. It seems I'm not that much in the family. Of course, Catherine may still change her mind, but it's my impression, Newland that most of the Mingard family has no particular interest in keeping Madame Olenska here. What were you and Cousin Henry discussing for so long downstairs, Newland? Oh, nothing, nothing at all. 
Have you a headache, dear? Yes. No. May, this lamp's smoking again. Can't the servants keep it properly trimmed? Oh, I'm so sorry. It shan't happen again. Uh, May. Yes, dear? I think I I have to go to Washington for a few days soon. Uh, next week, perhaps. Oh, on business. Naturally on business. There's a big patent case coming up for the Supreme Court. I see. Well, a change will do you good, dear. And you must be sure to go and see Ellen. Any further news, Mr. Letterblair? It's all over, Archer. It's the worst failure in the history of Wall Street. Everybody we know will be hit. Yes, one way or another. I'm as sorry for Mrs. Manson Mingott as for anyone at her age. And she made a friend of Beaufort. No telling what this will do to her. Well, we'll hope, sir. What is it? An urgent message from Mr. Archer, sir. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. It's uh, from my wife, sir. Would you excuse me? Read it, Archer. Read it. I'm afraid you were right to worry about Mrs. Mingott, sir. I'll have to go up there at once. My wife writes that her grandmother has had a stroke. Oh, now, Mama, please be calm. You can't help Granny by crying. Oh, Augusta, be quiet. That Regina Beaufort. And she could do such a thing. Well, you might have known what Granny's answer would be. Oh, but she would dare, asking Mother to stand by Beaufort in such a dishonor. <laughs> she said to me, but my name is Regina Dallas. And I said, it was Regina Beaufort when he covered you with jewels. And it's going to stay, Beaufort. Now he's covered you with Yes, Granny. Yes, but you mustn't talk now. Go to sleep. Yes, all right. Oh, I'm nothing but a sick old woman. I'm sick old. Oh, that woman. They say the diamond necklace she wore to the opera last week was sent on approval. Do you suppose the shop will ever get it back? Mama, you have things to worry about besides that. <laughs> Indeed, I have. What's to be done about Ellen? What about Ellen? Mother made us telegraph for her immediately. I can't imagine why. I suppose, Mama, that Granny wants to ask Ellen again to go back to her husband. Well, anyway, she'll be here. And there isn't a soul to go to Jersey City and call for her at the train. Well, that's all you're worrying yes, about. Dear? Uh, why, I was going to say, Mrs. Welland, I could go for her in May's carriage. Oh, what a relief. Why, of course, Newland. How clever of you. Yes, dear. How clever of you. Where shall I have the driver let you off, dear? Uh, at Union Square, if you don't mind. I'll, uh... I'll take the Broadway car back to the office. A uh, Newland? Yes, dear? I didn't want to bother Mama, but how can you meet Ellen tomorrow when you're going to Washington? Oh, I'm not going. Not going? Why, what's happened? Uh, the case is postponed. Postponed? Well, that's odd. I saw a note from Mr. Letter Blair to Mama saying he had to go to Washington tomorrow for the big patent case. You did say it was a patent case, didn't you, Newland? Well, that's it. The whole office can't go. Oh, then it isn't postponed. No, but my going is, and luckily for the convenience of your family. Why, yes, dear. It is awfully convenient. And you'll be able to meet Ellen, after all. It will be so convenient for everyone. Shall I tell you something, Ellen? When you got off the train, I hardly remembered you. Hardly remembered you? I mean, it's, it's hard to explain, but each time I see you, well, you happen to me all over again. Oh, don't. What a nice carriage. 
Is it Mays? Yes, it is. She sent you to fetch me then. Oh, how kind of her. Ellen, you must know this can't last. What? Our being together and and not being together. Oh, you're right. You you ought not to have come today. It's strange, though. I can sit with you like this and think of how our other life will be together and just quietly trust it to come true. What do you mean by trusting it to come true? Why, it will. It's got to. What a vision. Oh, Newland, will you look at reality? To me, this is the only reality. What is your idea, then? I can't be your wife, so... We've got to go away somewhere, someplace where we can be simply two people who love each other and nothing else matters. Oh, Oh, my dear, where is that country? Have you ever been there? I've known so many who have tried to find it, and they've all gotten out at the wrong station by mistake. Loin or Pisa or Monte Carlo, and they found it was no different at all. I suppose you're right. Oh, I am. Believe me, it's a miserable little country. But then, then what is your plan for us? Us? Oh, my dear, there is no us. We've got to stay far from each other. Otherwise, we're Newland Archer married to Ellen Olenska's cousin, and Ellen Olenska, cousin of Newland Archer's wife. Trying to be happy behind other people's backs. No, I'm beyond that. No, you're not. You never have been. I have. I know what it looks like there. Ellen. Please believe me. Yes, I believe you. Driver, stop the carriage. I'm getting out here. Six or seven days went by. I couldn't see Ellen, not at old Catherine's guarded bedside. And during that time, I made up my mind definitely that when she left New York, I was going with her. I was longing to tell her so. And when old Catherine sent for me to come to the house, I went eagerly. Go ahead and say it, Newland. I look hideous. My dear, you look you look handsomer than ever. <laughs> But not as handsome as Ellen, eh? Ah, pity she didn't marry you. Would have spared me all this worry. Fanny, what are you talking about? Oh, it's settled now. It's all settled. She's going to stay with me, whatever the rest of the family says. But you try to make her go back to Olenska. You cut off her allowance. Oh, they talked me over. Letty Blair and Augusta Welland and all of them. But she's going to stay. You mean here, always? Going to nurse her old granny. As long as there's a granny to nurse. She couldn't have gone back. It was impossible. I knew you were on her side. That's why I sent for you. You'll have to help me. My dear, I back you to hold your own against all of them. But if you want my help, it's yours. I knew I could count on you. The family never quotes you when they talk about her duty to go back home. Uh, now run along. I've finished with you. Is, uh, is Ellen here? May I see her? Oh, Ellen. <laughs> Ellen, my dear, has gone out in my carriage to see her poor cousin, Regina Beaufort. <laughs> So, it is always to be like this. What is? Slipping away to meet somewhere. (laughs) In Europe, one generally chooses a church. One has to go to the art museum sometimes. Yes. Oh, Newland. Newland, look in this case. What are they? Objects of Greek antiquity, use unknown. (laughs) These things were important to people once. After a while, nothing matters. Right now, everything matters. You said in your note that you had something to tell me. What was it? Ellen, you came to New York because you were afraid, didn't you? Afraid? Of my coming to Washington. Well? Well, yes. You knew then? Yes, I knew. Oh, Newland, this is better, isn't it? Better? We shall hurt the others less. It's what you wanted, isn't it? To have you in reach and yet out of reach... 
to keep meeting you on the sly, I think is detestable. Oh, so do I. Then it's my turn to ask. What is it that you think is better? Well, I, I thought it would be safer to stay with Granny. Why safer? It will save us from doing an awful harm. Uh, don't let's... Don't let us be, be like all the others. What others? I'm no different from any other man. Shall I? Shall we be together once? And then I'll go home. Oh, Ellen, my dearest. Go home? What do you mean, go home? Home? To my husband? You expect me to agree to that? What else is there? I can't stay here and lie to the people who've been good to me. That's why I want us to go away together. And ruin their lives when they've helped me to remake mine. Oh, but listen, we have lives of our own. You're just afraid to face things as they really are. Call it that, then. I've got to leave now. Helen, wait. Yes? I... I can't. All right. Once, then. Let us be together once. Very well, Mullet. When? Tomorrow? The day after. My darling. I, I must go. I, I shall be late. Granny will be waiting. Don't follow me, Newland. I must go. Vander Lydens. Lovell Mingotts and Reggie Charles, uh, Selfridge Marys, of course, Lawrence and Gertrude. Yes, dear? May I've got to talk to you. My father, the Sillerton Jacksons. Can it wait a little while, dear? No, I, I'd rather we talk now. I've got to tell you something. Well, all right, dear. But I was just planning a dinner. What is it? It's about Ellen. Why should we talk about Ellen? Because we should have talked before. I don't know if it's worthwhile, dear. Perhaps I've been unfair to Ellen sometimes, but what does it matter now that it's all over? All over? What do you mean? Why, well, that's why I was planning this dinner. For Ellen. I mean, now that she's going back to Europe... What? And now that Granny's going to make her independent of her husband... No, no. Why, yes, dear. You were so late coming home tonight, I thought you'd been at the office settling the arrangements. It's impossible. Impossible? How? How do you know what you just told me? Well, I saw Ellen yesterday at Granny's, and we had a wonderful talk. She told you then? Well, no. I had a note from her this afternoon. She's sailing next week. I thought you knew. May, why did she write to you? Well, I suppose because we talked things over yesterday. What things? Well, uh, I told her I knew I hadn't always been fair to her and hadn't understood how she'd feel to be here among strangers, everybody criticizing her and not knowing the circumstances. Oh. And I knew you'd always been the one friend she could count on, dear. I wanted her to know that you and I were the same in all our feelings. Yes, the same. I think Ellen understands everything now, Newland. I... I have a little headache, dear. I, I think I'll say good night. Uh, good night, Newland. Good night, Lovell. Good night, Sullivan. The dinner was a complete success, my dear. Oh, thank you, Mama. Good night. Oh, well, it went beautifully, didn't it, Newland? Let's sit down and talk it all over, shall we? Why, yes, if you like. But you must be awfully tired. No, I'm not. I'd like to sit with you a little. Very well. Shall I get you a brand and eat it, dear? No, no, thank you. May, there's... Uh, something I've got to tell you. I, I tried to the other night. Yes, dear. Something about yourself? About myself. May, you say you're not tired. Well, I am horribly tired. Oh, I've seen it coming on, Newland. You work much too hard. I want to go away at once on a, on a long trip away from everything. Away from everything? Where, dear? Oh, I don't know. Well, I'm afraid you can't, dear. What? That is, unless you take me with you. That is, if the doctors will let me go. Doctors? Yes, but I'm afraid they won't. You see, I found out for sure this morning. Something I've been hoping for for so long. I... I'm going to have a baby, dear. May. Are you happy, Newland? 
Oh, my dear. You didn't guess? Yes, I know. That is, of course, I was hoping. May, have you told anyone else? Only Mama. Well, that is, Mama and Ellen. And Ellen? Yes, dear. You remember I told you we had a long talk one afternoon. I see. Did you mind my telling her first, Newland? Mind? Mind? Why should I mind? But that was two weeks ago. And May, you said you weren't sure until today. No, I wasn't sure then. But I told her I was. And you see, Newland, I was right. Listening to The Age of Innocence, an NBC University Theater production of the Edith Wharton novel starring John Sutton. Next week at the same time, we will bring you another classic of American literature, The Ambassadors by Henry James. Age of Innocence was adapted for radio during the intermission you heard Bennett Cerf, whose commentary was recorded. Sutton, Newland, Archie. Our cast included Frederick Ayers, Ravenel, Gloria Ann Simpson, Myra Marsh, Gretchen North, Norman Field, Stephen Chase, Carl Day, and your announcer, Hal Gibney. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Dr. Albert Harris. The director of the NBC University Theater is Andrew C. Love. Next week, be with us again. The dramatization of Henry James' classic novel, Ambassador. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.